Good evening. Um, my name is Maggie Bolton. I am a lecturer in the Department of Anthropology here at the University of Aberdeen. And I'm going to give this um, evening lecture in the museum series. The title of my talk tonight is Abedonians in Early Bolivian Industry, the Penny and Duncan Mining Company. Um, photograph on the slide there shows a mine. It's at a place called Morocco Cala in Aurora Department in Bolivia. And it was owned by the Penny and Duncan Mining Company until about 1923. So the the talk tonight is going to be looking at the story of a Scottish-owned mining company in the early 20th century and a bit of the background to, to it. Um, and this story brings to light some very interesting and unexpected connections between Bolivia and the northeast of Scotland and the university as well. Um, the talk is really to explore the background to parts of the exhibition Abedonians in the Americas, which is currently at the King's Museum. Um, and part of the exhibition focuses on James Duncan and his wife Isabella, which is a sort of rags to riches story of a couple from, of, from humble origins in Aberdeenshire who became rich from Bolivian tin mining. And they donated quite a few objects and an extensive collection of photographs to the University Museum. It's a story that's interesting in itself. It's also interesting in what it says about British involvement in the recently independent Latin American states in the 19th century. Um, and what we term informal empire. Britain wielding a strong influence over the mining industry in Republican Bolivia, controlling supplies of mining materials and machinery, infrastructure and processing of metal ores. So I'm, I'm interested in these things and also want to have a, a look at relations between these people who migrated to the Americas and the different sorts of people in Bolivian society. So I'll, in doing this talk, what I'm going to do is, first of all, tell you very briefly about what my interests are in all this story. And then I'm going to focus on two, two Abedonians who be became rich in Bolivia. The first of those was in the 19th century and was the first Andrew Penny who went to Bolivia. Um, I find his story quite, quite interesting, although we haven't got the sort of extensive materials donated to the university that we have from James Duncan. Um, the second is James Duncan, who was in partnership with Andrew Penny's nephew, who was also called Andrew. My interest in all of this is that um, I've done ethnographic field work in Bolivia as an anthropologist. Um, I am an anthropologist rather than a historian, so I perhaps have slightly different interests than a historian would have. I'm more interested in things like social relations and processes rather than events as such. But I did my field work in Bolivia. Um, I started going to Bolivia in the 19 early 1990s. Um, I didn't do field work whether either the Pennies or the Duncans mined, but I did work with miners during my PhD research. Um, <coughs> the picture on the left is of uh, a mine that I worked in when I was doing my field work. Um, it was a very small family-run affair when I was there. Um, the, the miner in the photograph is called Don Ronaldo Gutierrez. Uh, he's making a hole for dynamite, for put a dynamite charge in, and he's being helped by his daughter, Nancy. Um, and the sort of connection with 
the stories of Penny and Duncan are that the mine that they worked in was active in the 19th century. It was being mined for silver in the 19th century. And the building that you can see in the right-hand photo um, is what remains of a building that was built for a steam engine by a mining company that was the Compagnia Esmoraca. Um, it was built for a steam engine that was being shipped from England to the Chilean coast and then brought up from the coast in its components. There wasn't a railway going all the way then, so partly the journey had to be done on the back of mules. Um, and the, the steam engine was there to drain the mines. It was to, to pump water out of the mines. In my research, I'm interested in, in, in mining, also interested in llama herding. So I'm interested in people's relations with materials, but also people's relations with animals. So that's enough about me. That's why I was very interested when I found that there was a collection of photographs of a Bolivian mine in special collections in the university. And this is how this research that is still ongoing got started. How many of you know Bolivia? <laughs> Chuck, yes. OK, so it's not too relevant to put this up as the next thing. Um, just a map to locate you. Bolivia is one of only two landlocked countries in South America, the other being Paraguay, sort of cent situated more or less sort of in the centre of the continent. When the sort of stories that I'm going to be talking about started, it wasn't a landlocked country. We're going to be starting to talk about Bolivia in the 19th century, and at that time it had a strip of coast in, in Chile that included the port of Antofagasta and another port that's not marked on this particular map, which is called Cobija. I quite like this map because it shows things like railways which were being constructed in the 19th century. Um, you see there's a railway going from the port of Antofagasta up into the mountains and it crosses what's now the Bolivian border at a place called Oyagüe and goes to the town of Iuni. Then there are branches, one going down to Argentina, one going up to one of the places I'm going to be talking about, which is Oruro which is both a city and the name of an administrative department which is in this sort of area of Bolivia. Um, the other place I will be mentioning um, will be Potosí, which was an important mining centre from the early colonial period. Um, that's sort of most of what I'm going to be mentioning. I might mention... Um, a little town called Waki, which is on the coast, on the, on the shore of Lake Titicaca up in the mountains. The mines in Bolivia are located in the Highland region. Um, if you look, this huge <coughs> eastern area of Bolivia is tropical lowlands. Then you get a sort of a halfway place where you start to get the foothills of the, the Andes Mountains. And the mines are all in the really high mountains and the high plateau, the, the Altiplano. So I was going to start off with just talking about mining in Bolivia very briefly to, to set the scene a bit. Mining has long been important in the Andes. In pre-Hispanic times, people mined gold, silver, copper, and tin. They made tin and arsenic bronzes. They were quite clever at making alloys as well with um, copper and gold or copper and silver. The region was colonized by Spaniards um, in the 1530s, and from then onwards, Spanish colonists mined silver. And the silver mines of a place called Potosí, which I showed you on the last map, um, really sort of propped up the Spanish crown for a couple of centuries. 
financially. This is the city of Potosi, um, and the mines are all in this hill, which is called Cerro Rico. In colonial times, those mines were worked by a labor draft of indigenous men from the surrounding communities. Tin, which we're going to talk about quite a lot later on, was not particularly important to the Spaniards at all. They needed some, but it was sort of for local use, to make pewter, to make church bells which are made of bronze, which apparently has a 22% tin content. Um, so they needed some tin, but they just had one or two mines, didn't do any exporting. Our next, this slide, um, is a 17th century illustration of silver mining in the city of Potosí under Spanish colonialism. It's quite an interesting illustration because it shows minerals being brought down from the mines by, by these animals which are trains of, of llamas. It looks like it shows people going up the hill as well towards the mines and in the foreground you've got a, a refinery. This was where the silver ore was first of all ground to a powder by an array of hammers that were turned by a water-powered wheel um, and then the powdered ore was mixed with mercury in these vats and it was trampled by the feet of the indigenous labourers who were drafted in to work both the mines and the refineries. This was a process that came into force in the sort of second phase of silver mining at Potosí. To begin with, most of the refining of richer ores was done by indigenous people using their own furnaces which were called wiras. They were like sort of chimney stacks, really, and set upon hillsides. And they achieved high temperatures um, because they had lots of holes in them that the, the sort of winds that, um, that blow in the Andean mountains sort of enter and raise the temperature. So uh, why I want to talk about this a bit is that there was quite a lot of metallurgical knowledge in the Andes Way, going way back and different sorts of knowledge some of it the knowledge of indigenous people and their understandings of metals other knowledge brought by Spanish colonialism um, not sort of scientific knowledge about metals as we understand it but more based in alchemy and these two sorts of knowledges met under Spanish colonialism and at times sort of converged. There were some similarities there. Right, that's, that's, sort of, that's my general preamble to mining in the Andes. And I want to turn now to the life of the first of these miners that I want to talk about tonight. And this is Andrew Penny. We don't know as much about him as we do about Duncan because uh, he didn't leave anything to the university. <laughs> he hasn't left a collection of photographs or, or anything. But um, there is quite a bit written about him if you look around. And um, I'm very grateful to one of our postgraduate students, Alison Noble, who did a lot of searching in Abedonian newspapers over the summer for me. Um, Andrew Penny was born in Aberdeenshire in 1832 and Deeside, and he was the son of a stonemason. And it's a sort of a theme that's going to run through these people who went to Bolivia, in that they, they seem to have backgrounds in stonemasonry before they go. Andrew Penny became a sailor. He joined a ship, um, and it sailed to South America. And he jumped ship in Cobija, one of those ports that was, that's on what's now the Chilean coast, but then, before the War of the Pacific, belonged to Bolivia. 
and that was probably in about 1852. He made his way up into the highlands, um, probably by mule at that time, and he tried his hand, got into the mining business. He went into business with a Frenchman um, who apparently was a, a count or some sort of nobleman called um, the Comte de la Rivette. And the two of them became owners of a silver mine in Aurora called the San Jose Mine. Um, not very long afterwards, the Frenchman died in Chile and the mine passed to Andrew Penny. There were some lawsuits. I found um, various pamphlets from Bolivia in the 19th century suggesting that the heirs of La Rivette um, tried to get their share of the mine, but Andrew Penny managed to hang on to it. It's quite exciting for me finding that he, um, he mined the San Jose mine in Aurora because in the 1960s and 70s, an anthropologist called June Nash did her research there and wrote a well-known ethnography called We Eat the Mines and the Mines Eat Us, which actually was what originally inspired me to go into anthropology. So it's sort of quite interesting to come sort of full circle and find out who owned that mine in the 19th century. Um, Andrew Penny married a Bolivian woman in, we think, 1882. They didn't have any children, but he adopted the illegitimate son of one of his managers. Um, the manager was, his surname was Mackenzie, and he was some, from somewhere in Perthshire. And he'd had a son with a Bolivian woman. Um, he bought an estate called Chivisivi, in La Paz department in Bolivia um, and he died in about 1890. We don't have a picture of Andrew Penny but we do have a picture of some of his llamas. Um, I found this in a missionary account, um, a, a, a 19th century missionary society writing about their work in South America, and we've got llamas bringing fuel to the benefiting establishment of Mr. Andrew Penny. The gentleman has shown himself a warm friend of missionaries. The benefiting establishment is a refinery, um, and we know a little bit about how he was doing his refining, partly because of what's been, what Duncan wrote and what Duncan's biography, bi biographer wrote um, about this period of, of Duncan's life when he started working for Andrew Penny. We know how Penny was refining silver because James Duncan's first job when he arrived in Bolivia was to supervise the silver refining. And he was supervising a process in which the mercury amalgamation, they're still using mercury mixed with silver ore to refine silver and boiling it in copper cauldrons. And this is a process that is documented in a 17th century text that's really, really famous among metallurgists in Bolivia. It was written by uh, a Spanish priest who'd gone over to Bolivia, not, it wasn't Bolivia at the time, uh, it, was, it was called Alto Peru, and he was stationed in various mining centers there. Um, San Cristobal de Lipes, I can't remember which other ones. Potosí, yeah, he was in one of the, the churches in Potosí. And he obviously really knew the practical sides of working with metals inside out and documented the whole lot. Um, and that's the process that Andrew Penny was still using in the 19th century that made James Duncan ill. It was a process that was based more in 
alchemy than science. Um, and an anthropologist called Tristan Platt has written quite extensively about it in one of his articles. Let's uh, give you a bit of sort of background to what British involvement in 19th century silver mining in Bolivia w was like. During the colonial era, there was absolutely no British involvement at all in mining in the Spanish dominions in the Americas because the Spanish Empire was an extremely secretive place, restricted the, um, the entry of people from outside Spain. Um, during the 18th century, it started to open up a little bit to um, scientific expeditions but it wasn't really until after independence from Spain when the, the Bolivian state came into being that Europeans from other countries started to get involved. And it, it, I think the first to get involved were the French. As you remember, Andrew Penny's first, his partner in the San Jose mine had been a Frenchman. A bit later in the 19th century, Britain started to wield quite a, a strong influence over the, the mining industry through controlling the supply of mercury. And it was the Rothschild um, business that controlled that. Rothschild controlled the production of mercury from the south of Spain, from a place called Almaden, um, and imported the mercury to London. And it's a really sort of tortuous route to get it to Bolivia. From London, the mercury was moved by canal to Liverpool from where it was exported to the port of Cobija again, which was then in Bolivia. And then once in Cobija, it would have been moved up into the Andes on the backs of either mules or, y or llamas. Um, mercury, as you know, is a liquid metal so it had to be contained in flasks. And initially those flasks were made of leather, but later on they were made of other metals, I think including tin. So, uh, sort of mid-19th century, Britain was starting to exert quite a bit of control over mining in Bolivia. And as the focus in mining in Bolivia shifted towards tin, for which there was a lot of new demand in Europe and the United States for, for plating metal, as in tin cans, um, and for solder. British miners and entrepreneurs started to take quite a lot of interest and control of tin mining in the, the independent state. Bolivia was particularly independent right up into the, into the 20th century um, on Britain for smelting tin. Bolivia wasn't able to smelt adequate quantities of tin because there was insufficient fuel there. Although it's, it's incredibly rich in metals and minerals, it hasn't got coal. And the, in the, the highland region, there's no real source of wood either. I think the Spanish colonists in the 16th and 17th century got rid of most of that. Returning to Penny, I said a couple of slides ago that he became a sailor and went to South America in the 1850s. He didn't go back to Scotland until the beginning of the 1880s. I think he made a visit, first of all, after he'd got married in 1882, much to the surprise of his family, who had assumed by then that he was dead. Um, and we know a little bit about him coming back on a visit to Aberdeen in around 1887 to 1888. And that's when he bought himself a country estate at Park on Deeside for £47,000. If you Google the um, estate of Park on Deeside these days, you'll see that it's a sort of very 
high class fishing venue. I think he was, at this time, it seems like he was trying to sort of set himself up for a, a very comfortable retirement. Um, soon after he'd returned to Bolivia after this visit, he bought the estate in La Paz department. Um, but while he was in Aberdeen, he donated some mineral specimens to Marshall College, um, with some of his press cuttings at the time. He exhibited what sounds like an absolutely huge nugget of silver in a shop in Aberdeen. Um, there is pre at present on view in the shop of Mr. Middleton, 2 Baker Street, a fine specimen of silver ore weighing over 200 weight from the mines of San Jose, Bolivia, etc. And <coughs> he also bought a load of machinery worth £3,000 for mining. Um, if you look at the press cutting there, you see Mr. Andrew Penny, proprietor of the San Jose silver mines, Aurora, Bolivia, having determined to still further develop the valuable property he holds there, has just placed with Mrs. Ben Reed and Company, Aberdeen, a large order for mining machinery, consisting of engines, boilers, winding gear, and steel ropes, to the value of over £3,000. The next bit I think is really interesting. The specifications stipulate that the machinery shall be of the highest standard, a feature of the order being that on account of the peculiar mode of transit, no individual part of the machinery shall exceed £300 in weight, as transport from the coast can only be by a service of mules, on whose back the machinery is carried to its destination. So, at that time, the railway from the coast of Chile up into the Bolivian highlands was not completed, so machinery was all having to be carried up the mountains on the backs of mules and as far as Aurora and then assembled at its destination. Penny was accompanied on this visit to Scotland by his wife, um, who was a lady called Maria Galindo. And we hear a lot more about her after Penny's death in 1890. Andrew Penny died in test eight. He didn't die at his mine. He died in Bolivia, but he was presumably on some sort of mining business at the time at a place called Huanchaca, which is quite famous for its mines. It's in Potosi Department, the south of Potosi Department. So I think at the time, I, I think it must have been a sudden illness that, that we don't know what he died of, but other people who died in Bolivia at around that time, they're dying of things like pneumonia, um, small, there was a smallpox epidemic, um, people were getting rheumatic fever. There's, there are quite a few sorts of diseases that seem to take people quite, quite suddenly. And that seems to be what happened to Andrew Penny. His wife, um, Maria Galindo, we, we find lots of um, accounts of her in the press. They're, they're quite varied. Some of them are, are quite sort of racist about her and describe her as an Indian crone. Um, however, James Duncan, in, in, uh, in a piece from his memoir that's quoted by his biographer, describes her as a very beautiful woman of Spanish descent. And I'm inclined to believe Duncan that she may have been of Spanish descent because Galindo is not a surname that you would associate with indigenous people in Bolivia. Um, 
And the way that she behaved after Penny's death suggests that she was pretty confident about moving in the upper echelons of society. She came over to Aberdeen because the estate at Park had been claimed by Andrew Penny's brother um, and although he hadn't left a will, her husband hadn't left a will, she'd found, or her lawyers had found, an obscure piece of Scottish legislation that enabled a widow in those circumstances to claim a third of the income from her dead husband's property. So she came over to do this and the case went to court and she won. Um, the brother decided to appeal that and in the appeal was making all sorts of allegations like she wasn't properly married to uh, his brother as, as he probably would. Um, in the meantime, the widow, and we're not quite sure of her age, some reports that I, I can't verify seem to suggest that she was quite a lot younger than Andrew Penny. Um, it seems possible. Certainly when she remarried another relative of the Penny family, who um, was about 20 at the time. So I don't, you know, I think it's unlikely that she was a lady in her 50s. Um, and it's more likely that <coughs> maybe there was about 20 something years between her and Andrew Penny. But when she, got, when she got married again, she seems to have repented of uh, her decision pretty quickly. And it seems to have been when she realised that under British law, her husband would have access to all her property. And then she goes back to Bolivia and she's trying to get the, the marriage annulled. Uh, and she's working with a quite very high class lawyer over there. Um, who later became a president of Bolivia. Um, but she dies quite suddenly soon after that, in about 1892. She was actually, according to one source I found, a bit worried that her, hus her new husband was trying to poison her. Um, and she tries to exclude him from, from her properties and all sorts of things like that. Um, but after her death, she leaves the property, her heir is the adopted son, um, and she tries not to, she tried not to let her new husband have the property. Eventually the lawyer that, who became president of Bolivia ends up with some of it, um, and, <laughs> well, lawyers, yeah. <laughs> um, and the, the adopted son who'd been brought up in Aberdeen uh, but went over to Antofagasta in what was then Chile, what became, had become part of Chile, to live um, with a Scottish wife. He inherited quite a lot as well. When I was um, idly googling things about Mrs Penny Crake as she became last night. I found a really interesting story in the Edinburgh Evening News of 1893, suggesting that when she died, her body was taken to a country estate from where it was stolen by thieves seeking jewels, and was later abandoned and eaten by carrion crows. I've never seen a, a crow in Bolivia, actually, but um, it's, it sounds likely that she might have been buried in a sort of niche burial and this sort of Spanish style, maybe in a chapel of her estate and that her grave might have been robbed afterwards. But all I've got is this small cutting from the Edinburgh Evening News. Right, that's Andrew Penny. Um, I'll move on now to James Duncan. James Duncan was born in New Leeds, Aberdeenshire, in the north of Aberdeenshire in 1858. 
he was the illegitimate son of a servant and he found work as an apprentice, as a young man, as an apprentice stonemason for a branch of the Penny family. And he travelled to Bolivia in the company of a younger member of the Penny family. When he, as a young man, he was about 20-ish yes, about at the time. We know quite a lot about um, James Duncan, partly from the photographs that he left to the university, but also because the North East Aberdeenshire author David Toulmin wrote a biographical account of his life. Toulmin's a really, um, it gives a really good account when he's writing about Aberdeen. Um, he knows in Aberdeenshire who owned what farm, when they sold it, um, etc., etc. <coughs> but he'd clearly never been to Bolivia. And um, I would love to find the original manuscript that James Duncan wrote, that I've been unable to track down so far. Because Tolman, when he's writing about Bolivia, he seems to have based quite a lot of what he was writing. Um, he seems to have used as a model the film of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Um, it might not be that unsurprising because Duncan reputedly employed Butch Cassidy for a while as a security guard at one of his mines. But um, he's got these, these sort of wonderfully imaginative passages about Duncan being in the saloon in Aurora and going in through the swing doors and... Um, <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, James Duncan travelled to Bolivia um, probably in about 1880, early 1880s, um, in the company of one of the younger members of the Penny family. And he worked for Andrew Penny for a while. This is when he was working with the Copper Cauldrons doing the silver refining and got ill. So he left Penny's employment partly because he'd got ill but partly because I think he just didn't think he was getting paid well enough and decided to try his luck mining on his own. So he did, he tried mining in different places. He mined silver at Potter's Sea um, and apparently he started to try and get one of those refineries like in the 17th century illustration working again there. I think he made some money at Potter Sea. Um, then he went off and he prospected for gold in the Beni for a while. The Beni is a tropical part of, of Bolivia. I don't think that was very successful. But he went into business with a nephew of Andrew Penny, who was also called Andrew Penny, um, and became rich when he found a very rich tin vein at a place called Wanuni. Wanuni is um, it's a mine that's still working in Bolivia. I've actually been down it many years ago. Um, it's, I think, probably about the last state-owned mine that's still being worked by the state mining company in Bolivia, Comibol. But he acquired other mines at one at Morocco Cala, um, another at a place called Negro, Negro Pabellon. But by that time, the transition to tin mining from silver mining had happened. And this is where I bore you a bit with some more information about uh, mining in Bolivia and the transition from silver to tin. Um, a bit more about how, how Britain was in control of a lot of the, um, the mining activities. The last slide about mining, I <coughs> was saying that Bolivia was dependent upon Britain for smelting tin. Um, and as tin production became important, tin ore from Bolivia 
were shipped to Britain as, as concentrate for smelting in British refineries. First of all, these refineries were in Cornwall, where the main tin mining industry in, in Britain was. Later on, um, one of the smelting companies built a smelter at Liverpool because that was where the tin ore was arriving. So there had been quite a lot of British input into tin mining in Bolivia. Cornish mining engineers and smelters travelled to Bolivia to advise Bolivian tin miners. They actually found, found that in Bolivia, people mining tin were doing pretty much the same process that they were doing in Cornwall anyway. But British engineers were also involved in the construction of transport infrastructure. Railways between the Bolivian Altiplano and the, the Chilean and Peruvian coasts. Um, and Britain really achieved control of the global tin production in the late 19th century. So this, this was a sort of way of, a sort of an addition to the, the, sort of the British Empire, a, a sort of an informal sort of colonial activity. In addition to the Toulmin's <coughs> account of Duncan's activity in Bolivia at the time, there's another account written by somebody called A.V.L. Guise, um, which seems to be from the, the latter part of the era <coughs> in which Duncan was in Bolivia, um, probably around late 1910s, early 1920s. And this, this other man, Guise, started as an engineer close to where Duncan's mines were in the Ruro department. Um, he also worked, guys also worked in the tropical part, in the Beni, where Duncan prospected for gold. And guys was involved in assembling a dredger down there, um, taking all the different parts that had been sh um, taken up from the Chilean coast by train at that time, and then no doubt transferred to mule carts after that and taken down by mule to the tropical parts of Bolivia. Actually, on the, the Butch Cassidy question, Guys was writing year, a few years after Butch Cassidy's death, but he recounts also meeting a surviving member of the Hole in the Wall gang when he was working near Aurora. Um, and you, you get a bit of an idea of what was going on with these North American outlaws going down to Bolivia at the time. They're actually after mine payrolls. Mining companies had to go to the cities to get the pay for all their employees and bring it back to the mine. Um, and this, this man, Guy's, had to do this once, and he recounts how he put all the all the money, all the, the pay for all the mine's employees into a biscuit tin and gave it to an indigenous um, companion that he'd got to carry in his bundle so that it wasn't at all obvious to anyone that, uh, that might try to rob them. I mentioned the railways. These are some of Duncan's photographs from the collection that we've got. Um, there, are, there were a lot of Again, British-made locomotives on railways in the Andes at this time. If you go today to a, a, a town called Uyuni in the south of Bolivia, any sort of tour guide there will be very keen to show you the, the train cemetery, where there's the, there are piles of rusting locomotives, sort of like the one that you can see here, which is actually just over the border in Peru, and at a place called Puno. The railway you can see here no longer exists. That was a railway that used to go from La Paz down into a region called the Yungas, a semi-tropical region that, that's actually quite close to La Paz, but down, down a very steep hill to, to get to it. And the engineer I was talking about, guys, would have had to take the parts for his dredger 
down that way and probably use that railway for part of the journey. Um, this is a, a picture of the Penny and Duncan tin concentration plant, which is at a place called Pyrumani. Duncan, as I said, went into partnership with the nephew of the first Andrew Penny and with him established the Penny and Duncan Mining Company in 1894. Andrew Penny seems to have been a rather lesser partner in the, the enterprise and he died in 1908 from pneumonia. Newspaper cuttings suggest that a, well, a, to say that a portrait was painted of him and was exhibited in Aberdeen in March 1907. His whereabouts aren't known now. And after his death, the running of the company passed to James Duncan. Duncan continued to make payments for the mining, of the income from the mining company to Penny's estate into the 1920s. I already said the first mine from which they made money was at Guanuni, um, a site that's still being mined today. It wasn't the only mine at Guanuni. There was another, um, we know, that was worked by a company called El Balcon, which was owned or controlled by an Irishman called Minchin. Eventually, Duncan sold his interest in Wanuni to Simon Patino, who was later known as the, the King of Tin, and became one of the powerful tin barons in Bolivia in the first half of the 20th century. Um, Patinho's main or most productive mine was a, at a place called Uncia, but when he first discovered the vein that made him rich, which was a, a, a vein of tin called La Salvadora, he sent the sample, he sent someone running with the sample down to Penny and Duncan's assaying laboratory at Wanuni to be tested. So Bolivians today remember that about the Penny and Duncan Mining Company. Um, Duncan's other mines, he had mines at a place called Morocco Cala, which was again in Aurora Department and another at Negro Pabellon, which I, was also in a rural department. Um, the picture on the left is of the store, the company store at Morocco Cala. And I quite like that picture because there's quite a lot going on. Um, you can see the mules outside, presumably waiting to transport something. Um, a group of men leaning against the building, probably chewing coca. A group of women huddled around, presumably something that they're, they're, they're wanting to buy, some sort of household commodity. Um, the, the picture of the compressed air drill is one of the pictures that Duncan took in, in, in three dimensions. He had a stereoscopic camera and, in fact, the glass plates um, positive slide that that's taken from, there are actually two pictures side by side. And if you look at them through um, a, a sort of a stereoscope, it really looks as if they're, it's in three dimensions. They, they look a bit like cardboard cutouts when you look through them, but you, can, you really get a 3D effect. Um, Duncan's personal life. It's recounted in Toulmin's book that in, the, in his early days of being in Bolivia, 
Duncan had a relationship with a Bolivian woman who was also his cook. Um, and he had four children with her who all died of smallpox in an epidemic in the 1890s. We don't know much information about this relationship, it's about its status. In, uh, in anthropology and studies of colonialism, there's a lot written about gender relations and y you wonder what sort of relationship this was. Was it, um, he didn't actually marry this woman, but she was known as Doña Margarita. And in the Andes, Doña is a form of address that's used as a mark of respect to a woman who's considered to be adult and married. So perhaps her relationship with Duncan was regarded as official. We don't know what Duncan thought about it. Um, but it, you have to remember that he himself had been an illegitimate child. The relationship came to an end after the children died. And in Tolman's book, it stated that Doña Margarita took to drink, which could well be true, but you don't know what happens when somebody loses four children. That must be pretty devastating. There's one picture in a family album that's in special collections that I don't know that it's not labelled. I don't know whether this is Duncan and his Bolivian family or somebody completely different. It's um, looks like a Bolivian woman and a European man and four children. And there's a dog in it, and the Don Duncan seems to have been very keen on his dogs because there are dogs in lots of his other photographs. But if anyone's got any ideas about that, I'd be very grateful to hear that. But the relationship came to an end after those children died, and it seems like soon afterwards, James Duncan met another woman um, in the plaza of Aurora who was Isabella Davidson. She was born in Aberdeenshire as well, in Netherkin Mundy, 11 years after Duncan in 1869. Um, and her father worked on a farm. She was a, a servant in Aberdeenshire, first of all at a manse, but she had to leave that employment after having had an illegitimate child. She left the child with relatives and for a while worked as a chambermaid in a hotel in Aberdeen. And she also worked for a family called Philp, who had connections with the pennies. Um, and Mr. Philp worked in banking and was sent out to South America and the couple took their maid with them. And she met James Duncan in about 1898 in Aurora in the plaza, and they were married soon afterwards. And had eight children in all. I think, I think one of them died, at least one died in infancy in South America. Yes. Oh, thank you. Um, Carry on looking at a few of Duncan's photographs um, and the sorts of people who were working for him in the mines. We've talked a bit about some of these Abadonians' connections with elites in Bolivia, with um, Penny's wife poss possibly being from an elite family and certainly moving in a circle that included elite lawyers. And I think. Duncan probably was positioning himself among 
elites in Bolivia at this time as well. But he's also looking after these mines. He got these mines in his possession and had very different sorts of workforce working for him. There are quite a few European people working in supervisory capacities as managers in his mines. But then he also had a lot of people working inside the mines who were urban or rural Bolivians of more or less indigenous ancestry. And what really strikes me in looking at these photographs of the mining workforce is actually the number of women that were working there. They're not, the women in the, the photograph by the, the mine headgear there, they're not just miners' wives. They also have important jobs. They work in the concentration plant. They're, they're helping to concentrate ores. They're selecting ore, getting rid of all the dross. And they're a proper part of the workforce. Later on in Bolivian mining, women seem to have got relegated to a much more, um, much more sort of peripheral position. You see today, if you go to uh, if you go to Potter Sea, you see women working the slag piles, but they haven't got sort of employment. They've got more permission to work the slag pile and to sell any mineral they find to um, the mining cooperatives that are working mines these days. But these women had jobs in the mines, and I'd always heard accounts of mines in the 1930s when Bolivia went to war with Paraguay over a region called the Chaco, when it was said that women went down the mines. And it was always said as if suddenly women had been found to, and, and made to go down these mines. But actually, women were there in the mining workforce all the time. They were, they were permanent members of the workforce at the time. I've seen one photograph from about the same era that looks as if women were also carrying ore to the surface. I suspect that men were doing the drilling to make holes for dynamite, though, because that's the sort of work that involves breaking the earth that Andean people consider to be the correct, work, the correct sort of work for men. It's the same in agriculture. Men break the earth went to plough the land and women put potatoes in the furrows. There were also quite a few children in the pictures working inside the mines. Um, this happens today in small mines in Bolivia, um, not on a huge scale and not in organised mines. But um, children's labour would have been uh, a sort of vital part of the family income at the time. The conditions inside the mines from Duncan's photographs look pretty much like the conditions you'd find in Bolivian mines today. Um, there's a lot more mechanisation than in that mine I showed you a picture of where I did some of my field work. That probably means there's a lot more dust around and um, hazards from respiratory diseases. But you get quite similar conditions today. You wouldn't get children working in a, um, a big company today, just, but you would in a, a sort of small family-run cooperative. And yeah, there are, there are hazards. The dust is hazardous. You can get respiratory diseases from that. A lot of miners die of silicosis. Other hazards you get in mines, well, rocks can fall from the, the roof of the mine. That can be dangerous. The thing that miners are scared of more than anything is finding po pockets of gas, um, the gas being carbon monoxide. Um, and having known quite a few miners, I've known a few people who've either had narrow escapes. I've known one who um, died from carbon monoxide poisoning in a mine. So that's, the conditions weren't good, but they haven't changed that much, is what I'm saying. I have to put a picture of this guy up here. It, 
as I'm talking about mines. This is the, the TO of the mines. It's in anthropological literature, it's very well documented that a figure in the shape of the devil of Christianity is considered to be the owner of minerals. Um, and miners make libations to him, on, usually on Tuesdays and Fridays. It's a long story. I could talk about him for about half an hour, but I won't because um, we haven't got that much time. More of Duncan's photographs. Um, uses of animals for transport at the mine. These are photographs I think were probably taken from about in about 19, early 1920s. And you see mule carts are still being used, and there are still loads of llamas around the mines that are probably bringing fuel. Um, fuel being um, firewood, which you can find in small quantities in the Bolivian countryside. Talking about transport, Duncan actually took a car with Aberdeen number plates to Bolivia at one point. There's a photograph of it in Tormin's book. In 1911, Duncan sold his interest in Wanuni, and he also at about that time returned to Scotland for a while. And this is when he built a mansion at Tillicorthy, or started the construction of a, a mansion at Tillicorthy. Uh, it's an interesting house. It's partly, it looks a bit like a, a sort of Scottish mansion, but it's built in the style, in the sort of courtyard style of a, a Spanish colonial building. Mm -hmm. um, and it was one of the first buildings that used reinforced concrete, interestingly. Um, between, after returning to Britain in, in 1911, he got stuck here for a while because of the First World War and eventually decided to risk the um, uh, attacks on merchant shipping and went back to Bolivia in 1916 and intermittently travelled backwards and forwards until the 1920s. About 1923, he sold most of his interests in Bolivia. Um, On returning to Scotland, he made Tillicorthy his family home. He had other houses in a other, few other places as well. But he became active in livestock improvement and also owned an e electricity generating company. And there's press reports of his company installing electric light at Ellen. So I've nearly finished now. Um, James Duncan donated quite a variety of objects to the museum, to the University Museum. They were donated at different times. Some were donated while he still had his mining interests in Bolivia, while he gave others to the museum after he sold his mines there. Um, the photographs were donated by his wife after he would died. He wasn't a terribly systematic collector. The objects he donated were, were quite a, an eclectic mixture of things. Um, he had objects, everyday objects from the Bolivian highlands, like in the photograph there you've got a, a llama wool sling, which would have been used for, by Andean people for hunting for just anything where you need to lob a, a, a rock any sort of distance, which people I've worked with usually use them to make their llamas turn while they're herding them. They sort of lob a, a rock in front of them. Um, so you've got everyday objects from the Bolivian highlands. One, one that I really like is this little carving of animals, a sort of miniature, and miniatures in Andean rural societies are, are sort of special. You look after them and they sort of help to make your herds increase. 
Has he donated other things? So a lot of things related to his mines and minerals, um, including the stalactite that we've got in the museum exhibition that was found in his Wanuni mine. But he's also got things like objects from the lowlands. The, the textile there is a, a tunic. We think it's from the Urakare people who live in the, the Beni region, which is the region where Duncan was prospecting for gold um, in his early days in Bolivia. So I don't know whether he acquired it from someone there or whether he bought it later on because it looked like something interesting and something that ought to be collected. One of the things in the exhibition is a shrunken head, not from Bolivia at all, from the Shua people in Ecuador. And I think he probably acquired that on travelling through the Panama Canal because I've seen records that there were shrunken heads on sale in Panama at the sort of time that Duncan went through it. And we know that Duncan went through the Panama Canal because he was very interested in it and took pictures of all the different locks and every little bit of the Panama Canal that he'd gone through. His photographs, as I said, are, are interesting. And this is a picture of one of his stereoscopic slides. Uh, the picture's from the carnival in Oruro. Um, the Bolivian carnival in Oruro is the biggest celebration of carnival in the country. It's a, it's now it's a huge tourist attraction. And dancers dance in devil costumes. This is partly related to the devil that's in the mine. Um, but Duncan took photographs of this uh, in 3D using his stereoscopic camera. Um, there were a few other people taking stereoscopic pictures in Bolivia at this time, but it wasn't common. Um, there was a, a German company that seemed to go around absolutely everywhere taking photographs of, of everything using a stereoscopic camera. Um, and you can probably find images of Bolivia on sale on eBay from them. But it wasn't very common. So as well as being a pioneer of the tin mining industry, Duncan was a pioneer um, of stereoscopic photography as well. That's practically all I want to say. Uh, I said the research that I've been doing about Duncan is ongoing. And I do want to go and have a research trip to Bolivia to work in the archives on both Penny and Duncan's activities. The photographs that we've got in special collections are interesting to Bolivians. I, um, as an experiment, put the advert for this talk on a uh, a Facebook page of old photos of Bolivia and have had quite a few responses from people very interested in their mining history um, asking how they could get access to this collection. So I would like to work with a Bolivian institution to try to set up some sort of digital archive and find a partnership to do something and perhaps put on a photographic exhibition in Aurora. That's um, just about all I've got to say. If you've got any time for questions, um, please ask. <laughs>